Hello, welcome to Transmissible Briefs. Today we'll talk about Q fever. We take a look at a recent Q fever alert from Australia. If you want to refresh your knowledge about this disease, then this podcast may be useful for you to complete. A Q fever alert was shared by PROMED on December 31st. PROMED is the global program for monitoring emerging diseases in which epidemiologists share daily information on disease outbreaks all around the world. The Q-Fever alert mentioned a report from one of the Adelaide newspapers the day before. The news item described a rise in local Q-Fever cases, doubling the number of infections since the previous year. Vaccination of animal workers was urgently advised, said the newspaper. Now let's recall what we know about Q-Fever. That story takes us back to the east coast of Australia, August 1935. Back then, an epidemic was ongoing among workers of an abattoir in Brisbane. Workers came down with high fever, resembling typhus, but in a few days they recovered. The chairman of the Queensland Meat Industry Board rang the Director General of Health and asked, what is this abattoir fever that our men are getting? The Director General decided to send Edward Derrick, whom he had just appointed as head of the Queensland Laboratory for Microbiology and Pathology. It was Derrick's job to find the cause of this outbreak. The disease resembled typhus, but all the usual tests remained negative. Derek tried to find evidence of other pathogens that could cause similar diseases in that part of the world. Typhoid fever, brucellosis, leptospirosis. All tests came out negative. The first progress came when Derek inoculated guinea pigs with the blood of cases. After an incubation period of around 8 to 14 days, the animals developed a fever lasting 4 to 6 days. Derek also found that guinea pigs that recovered from this fever would not get sick again after a new inoculation. They had become immune. And this made the first crude test to inoculate blood of a suspect case into one susceptible and one immune guinea pig. But the organism that caused the abattoir fever was not yet found and the disease was baptized Q fever, since the meat industry board was not too keen keep calling it abattoir fever. In October 1936, Derek sent a spleen of a guinea pig infected with Q-fever to Dr. McFarlane Burnett of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. Dr. Burnett transferred the infection to mice and was able to demonstrate colonies of rickettsiae in their spleens. In honor of Burnett's discovery, the organism was then called Rickettsia burnetti. But meanwhile, 9,000 miles away, the same pathogen was under scrutiny by a very different route. A bacteriologist in the Rocky Mountain Laboratory in Hamilton, Montana, was investigating ticks from a place called Nine Mile Creek. Gordon Davis was hunting for the pathogens that cause diseases such as Rocky Mountain, Spotted Fever and Tularemia. And his approach was to search for these agents in ticks. In this particular case he had collected a group of 200 Rocky Mountain wood ticks. The ticks had recently emerged from hibernation and Davis divided them into four groups of 50 and each group was placed on the shaved belly of, can you guess? <laughs> yes, a guinea pig. After 12 days, one of the guinea pigs developed a fever up to 41 degrees for six days and eventually died. Many tests were done, but Davis and his co-workers could not identify the agent and for a while they called it the Nine Mile Agent. Around the same time when Frank Burnett in Australia had identified the rickettsia that caused the Q fever, Dr. Harold Cox joined the Montana laboratory and helped to isolate the Nine Mile agent. They identified the culprit as rickettsia. The administrator of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Rolla Dyer, may have seemed a bit of a bullhead at first, allowing himself to be convinced by first-hand evidence mainly. He was highly skeptical of the claim that Nine Mile Island was a rickettsia. So he rushed out to Montana and into Cox's lab. Cox showed him the evidence on a microscope slide, and Dyer reversed himself, admitting the discovery, and stayed long enough around assisting Cox with the work to catch a dose of Q-fever himself. Ten days after returning to Washington, he felt sharp pains behind the eyes, followed by chills and fevers and night sweats for a week. By that time in Australia, McFarlane Burnett caught it too, demonstrating the risk of handling this pathogen in the laboratory. In 1948, the organism that Cox and Burnett independently had identified as a rickettsia was recognized to be different enough from all other rickettsia to deserve its own genus. And it was named Coxiella burnetti, honoring both scientists that had described it. And that name remains today. 
Coxella burnetti is a gram-negative pathogen and it is obligate intracellular. It is classified as protobacteria, the same group that contains bacteria such as Legionella. It replicates in host monocytes and macrophages. It has tremendous stability and can reach high concentration in animal environments. Because it forms unusual spore-like structures, it is highly resistant to environmental conditions and many disinfectants. Coxella burnetti can survive 7 to 10 days on wool at room temperature, for one month on fresh meat in cold storage, for 120 days in dust, and for more than 40 months in skim milk. The organism is killed by pasteurization. Coxella burnetti exists in two antigenic phases. This is important in the diagnosis of Q fever. Phase 1 is pathogenic and found in infected animals or in nature. Phase 2 is less pathogenic and is recovered only after multiple lab passages in eggs or cell cultures. In diagnostics, increased antibodies to phase 2 antigens indicate an acute infection, while a rise in phase 1 antibodies reflects a chronic infection of Q fever. Coxella burnetti is highly contagious. One single organism is enough to cause an infection. Now, once we are infected, what does Coxella burnetti do to us? In humans, incubation periods vary from 2 to 40 days, with an average of around 20 days. Half of the infections with Coxella burnetti are asymptomatic. People don't even notice they have the infection. The other half of the infection expresses two clinical forms of the disease. An acute form, with symptoms lasting less than six months, and a chronic form, with symptoms lasting longer than six months. So first, let's take a look at acute Q fever. Symptoms of acute infection can vary in severity and duration. Most cases experience a self-limited febrile or flu-like illness. The signs include fever, chills, sweats, headache, especially behind the eyes, but also tiredness, loss of appetite, energy loss, muscle aches and chest pain. The illness typically lasts from one to three weeks. 30 to 50 percent of the patients with a symptomatic illness will develop a pneumonia and in more severe cases a non-productive cough with pneumonitis may develop. The radiographs of patients with pneumonia resemble those of patients with viral pneumonia etiologies. Multiple rounded opacities of both lungs on chest x-ray may be noted and a pleural effusion may also be seen. Additionally, many clinically ill patients will have abnormal liver enzymes and some will develop hepatitis, but jaundice is rare. Then an exanthema or rash may occur in about 10% of the cases. Rarely meningoencephalitis or pericarditis may occur with acute infection. Still, up to 2% of the acute infections require hospitalization and a similar percentage results in death. This disease is far from innocent. Chronic Q fever, which is an infection greater than 6 months in duration, occurs in 1-5% to of those infected and therefore is relatively uncommon. It typically develops in persons with a pre-existing cardiac valvular disease. Immunocompromised persons and pregnant women are also at great risk for the chronic form. Endocarditis is the major clinical presentation and accounts for 60-70% to of all chronic Q fever cases. The infection can also affect the liver, causing granulomatous hematitis or cirrhosis. The Kupfer cells are considered to be the target cells for Coxella burnetti. Involvement in bone and arteries has also been reported. And patients who have had acute Q fever may also develop the chronic form as soon as one year or as long as 20 years after initial infection. The overall case fatality of chronic Q fever is up to 15%. Fatigue can persist after Q fever, accompanied by a host of other specific symptoms such as headache, disturbed sleep, night sweats, myalgia, arthralgia, blurred vision. Some call this syndrome the Q fever fatigue syndrome, but there are no uniform diagnostic criteria. Similar post-infectious fatigue syndromes are described after other infections, for example Ross River virus, Epstein-Barr virus and Legionella pneumophila. Although the etiology of QFS remains unknown, factors such as genetic predisposition, the host immune response, 
the severity of the acute illness and biopsychology could play a role. Five to ten years after onset of the illness, up to 42% of the patients may report Q fever fatigue syndrome. Reliable data on the effect of Q fever infection in pregnant women are limited. From published series of case reports, indications are about adverse pregnancy outcomes. However, published case reports may be highly selective and could cover extremely rare conditions. They do not inform us about the amount of risk per infection during pregnancy. During a large Dutch outbreak of Q fever, a group of pregnant women was followed closely, and in that group, infection in early pregnancy did not seem to be associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. The antibiotic treatment of choice is doxycycline. Antibiotic treatment is most effective when initiated in the first three days of illness. For chronic disease, treatment may be necessary for two to three years. Doxycycline and quinolones are contraindicated in pregnant women, so in these cases the clinician will need to balance the options for treatment. Persons recovering from Q fever are thought to develop long-lasting and possibly lifelong immunity. Now let's take a look at transmission of the Q fever agent. Aerosolization is a major form of transmission in humans. And where does this aerosol come from? Domestic ruminants represent the most frequent source of infection. Organisms can be found in airborne droplets of dust contaminated by placental tissues, birth fluids or excreta of infected animals. The shedding of Coxella burnetti into the environment occurs mainly during parturition. Over 1 billion bacteria per gram of placenta are released at the time of delivery. An aerosol or indirect transmission can occur when infected animals are processed as meat during necropsies or while assisting with deliveries. And due to the persistence of the organism in the environment, dried infective material can contaminate water, dust and soil. Coxella burnetti has been isolated downwind up to half a mile or more from a known source. Fomites, which could be newborn animals, wool, bedding, clothing, straw, can be contaminated and serve as a source of infection. Shedding in milk occurs due to infected mammary glands, but pasteurization kills the organism. Coxella burnetti has been naturally and experimentally isolated from a variety of arthropods, mainly ticks, but also cockroaches, beetles, flies, fleas, lice, mites. Animals typically acquire Q fever through exposure to other infected animals, either through direct contact with contaminated material or aerosol exposure. Person-to-person -person transmission of Q fever is extremely rare. Transplacental transmission may occur, resulting in congenital infection. Transmission from blood transfusion, bone marrow transplant and intradermal inoculations have also been reported. Transmission via sexual intercourse has been hypothesized. Sexual transmission of Coxella burnetti has been documented in mice and guinea pigs, but in a rare number of human cases it was only an hypothesis. Outbreaks of Q fever have been often described, and now we know how transmissible the agent is, this will not come as a surprise. Laboratory staff is at risk, especially when microorganisms are multiplied by culture. In occupational settings, animal handlers, workers in abattoirs and others exposed to contaminated animal products are at risk. Outbreaks among military troops have been described, in particular in deployments in areas with infected animals. And finally, residents of cities and towns can become infected just by breathing the air when they live downwind from farms, when they walk or cycle by roads that are also travelled by animals, or by handling contaminated materials such as straw. By far, the most impressive Q fever outbreak that I am aware of occurred in the Netherlands between 2007 and 2010. The outbreak is probably not the right word here, it was a downright epidemic. The Netherlands is the most densely populated member state of the European Union and in addition hosts intense levels of animal husbandry. Besides the 17 million inhabitants, the country hosts 4 million pieces of cattle, 13 million of farm pigs and 100 million of livestock poultry. Zoonoses are abundant as to be expected when high densities of population and animals are put together. Between 1980 and 2005, the average number 
of notified human Q fever cases in the Netherlands was 20 each year. And then between 2000 and 2005, the number of goats in the Netherlands nearly doubled. In 2005, Q fever was diagnosed on two dairy goat farms, with high abortion rates among the goats. By the way, human Q fever was made notifiable in the Netherlands in 1976, and since then no outbreaks of this disease have ever been reported, only sporadic human cases. Then, between 2007 and 2010, over 4,000 cases were reported in the Netherlands. A seroprevalence study demonstrated that over 40,000 people were infected during this Dutch outbreak of Q fever. In total, 285 chronic Q fever patients were identified, and only a quarter of the chronic patients could recall an acute Q fever episode. Over 800 Q fever fatigue syndromes were reported. The official death toll of people affected by the Q fever in the Netherlands since 2007 now stands at 74. Look at the timeline of the epidemic, where you can see huge seasonal peaks of cases occurring in early summer during those epidemic years. And finally, after the third epidemic wave in 2009, several veterinary control measures were implemented, including mandatory vaccination of dairy goats and dairy sheep, improved hygienic measures, and culling of pregnant animals on uninfected farms. The introduction of these specific veterinary measures has probably ended to the largest Q fever epidemic the world has ever seen, and for which the Netherlands proved to be ill-prepared. This is probably the most telling visual information on the Dutch epidemic. The map on the left shows the incidence of human cases per 100,000 residents per municipality. And since the map displays incidence, it directly shows the risk of becoming infected per area of residence. The right map shows the density of goats per square kilometer, and the dots and diamonds show the location of goat farms with Q fever infections. Proximity of infected goat farms combined with high density of goat population seem to be linked to an increased Q fever risk in humans. Okay. Let's go back to the ProMed alert of 31st of December about the local Australian outbreak. Now that we know a bit more about the disease and the epidemiology, I bet you're curious of what happens next after an alert like this. And we have a guest today um, who will tell us more about the Australian public health system and how it deals with Q fever. Welcome Dr. Paul Kelly, uh, Chief Health Officer and Deputy Director General in the Australian Capital Territory. Uh, Dr. Kelly, it's, it's a great pleasure and thank you very much for accepting the invitation to join us. Uh, thanks Arnold, that's uh, very um, nice to be here. Uh, let's, let's kick off immediately with uh, the topic. In your role as, uh, as a Chief Health Officer, you probably deal with notifiable infectious diseases a lot and Q fever is one of those diseases. Now, we know that Q fever can cause human infections, sometimes severe, and we also know it's rather rare and not communicable, uh, usually from person to person. What are the reasons for making such a disease notifiable in Australia? So notifiable diseases are indeed an important part of my work, and uh, we have many diseases which are notifiable uh, in Australia. The main reasons to make a disease notifiable is that there is a possibility of public health action, uh, either to uh, prevent uh, disease or to uh, minimise the, uh, the transmission. Uh, Q fever, as you say, is a relatively rare but important uh, member of the notifiable diseases list uh, throughout the Australian public health system. Uh, here in the ACT, we're a small jurisdiction with very little primary industry. It's rare for us to get more than two cases per year, uh, and they are mostly imported from other parts of Australia. Uh, Australia-wide, there's around 500 cases a year. That's a, a two per 100,000 um, uh, in our large country. So again, fairly rare uh, and tends to be sporadic. Uh, Q fever is, is associated with, uh, with animal handling, uh, particularly abattoirs um, and other, other places where animals are handled. Um, interestingly, perhaps to a, an international audience, uh, a couple of Australian specific issues here. One is that 
Um, Burnett was in fact a, uh, an Australian microbiologist of which we're very proud and did some of the, um, the seminal work around this particular disease and described uh, acute fever, which for some time uh, the, the transmissible agent was not, uh, was not well known. Um, the second is that um, we do have cases of Q fever which have been associated with our native animals, um, and including kangaroos. Uh, and so whilst most Q fever is from a very, is transmitted by a very intense, usually occupational uh, exposure, we have had cases where people have been mowing grass where kangaroos have been grazing. And so that it, it has been enough uh, and to develop Q fever and demonstrates the high transmissibility of this, of this organism. Now, if we take a look at the recent events that were reported earlier this month uh, by PROMED, uh, we understand it's about a local increase in Q fever. Um, does this have any significance at the national level? And if not so much, when would such a, an event become relevant? The notifications are collected at the state base. So in Australia, we have uh, six states and two territories. Uh, they are separate jurisdictions with their own notifiable disease database. Um, and uh, there are um, public health laws throughout Australia which, makes, uh, which make notifiable diseases mandatory reporting from laboratories usually and sometimes in certain circumstances, and acute fever is one of those, um, from clinicians. So we're, really we can think of something like Q fever, um, uh, there's, as they are sporadic, there is usually a local issue um, which is collected at the state base and then transmitted to, to the national. And in fact, in this case, uh, uh, this was um, one of our jurisdictions, South Australia, it's, quite, it's generally quite a, a, a large um, underpopulated rural area and a very densely populated um, single urban area in the capital Adelaide. Um, and this, this highlights an issue um, for Australia, which would be different from the Netherlands, for example, uh, a very um, concentrated non-rural population and a very, uh, very unconcentrated rural population uh, where the expertise and the collection of uh, and treatment uh, uh, is, is very much available in the urban area, uh, including public health authorities and the ability to respond. Uh, but some diseases like Q fever are really in the remote areas. Uh, so this particular case in South Australia, it, uh, it's a long way from here. Uh, the relevance for, for myself and my own jurisdiction that I'm responsible for, and my own public health laboratory, for example, is rather low. Um, but we do take note of these, uh, of these uh, cases definitely um, through various sources and, and um, if, if this was to develop into a larger outbreak in South Australia and was seen to be beyond the response capability of that particular jurisdiction, then there would be a national response. Um, and uh, we would meet uh, as, as chief health officers uh, and, and work out who could, could assist in those, in those type of uh, situations. If, if I can ask you about uh, these outbreaks in the Netherlands, uh, have they in, in any way influenced uh, Australian policy in any way, uh, knowing that, of course, the, the context between the countries is quite different? I would say that thinking of the timing of those Netherlands um, issues, as you mentioned, we already had quite a strong approach and, and proactive approach to Q fever at, at that period. We'd had our own smaller but relatively large outbreaks of Q fever, particularly related to abattoir workers. There was at around that time a, a national Q fever um, response task force and, and specific work, including, um, and this is a, an unusual situation in Australia, um, the provision of vaccination, free vaccination to, uh, to workers at high risk. Um, we have a locally developed uh, and licensed vaccine uh, for Q fever for use in humans, and that is actually the mainstay of our, of our control program. Um, so um, th there's sort of two answers to that question. Certainly we did notice the Netherlands situation, as we always do uh, in these situations, uh, but by then we already had our own uh, our own approach and and uh, using a tool which is not available in the Netherlands, which is around vaccination as a a way of pre preventing cases, as well as uh, as a 
a, a register actually run by uh, industry in relation to uh, vaccination of workers uh, and uh, education programs as well as uh, for both um, uh, medical practitioners, laboratory workers, uh, and, and particularly those uh, in the at-risk um, occupations. Um, can you tell us something about, uh, are there any particular reservoirs or sources in, in Australia linked to Q-fever? Uh, well, certainly goats are, are one of them and, and other other mammals uh, that are slaughtered. Um, uh, and um, the interesting thing about Q-fever is, although it, it's, it's, it's uh, blood, feces and urine, um, which appear to be the, the source, it's actually the transmissibility via by um, uh, aerosol, which is which makes it such a, a dangerous agent, which can actually be widely spread in in Australia. Though uh, abattoir workers, um, in particular, those those working with animals in other ways, including veterinary uh, surgeons, people that are in laboratories that are, are working on on Q fever, particularly where culture is is done, that's rare, but where it is done, that's a high risk uh, occupation. Um, and then unusually, um, we have we have found that our kangaroos and some other native animals, even birds, uh, um, are able to um, to be infected with Q fever, uh, and therefore can become part of the transmission chain. That would particularly be a risk for a wider group of people. Now, to maybe to close up, we have talked about the trigger for for this podcast and this interest, which was this uh, message in Promet. How relevant are alerts uh, such as reported by Promet for public health policy and, and for your day-to-day -day job? Uh, they're, they're highly relevant. We, um, we do take notice and I have uh, a team of, of workers who, who are part of their job uh, is to, to gather intelligence from wherever intelligence can be gathered. Um, and so the international situation uh, is an important one to, to keep track of. Um, uh, and so that so alerts like ProMed can be very influential. Um, so intriguingly, the South Australian one, I, uh, because of the time of year, I, I actually heard about it from you. <laughs> so so the uh, rather than than the more sort of uh, traditional way that I'm I'm informed. Um, but and and when I looked uh, to see what had happened around that South Australian um, outbreak that was was talked about in ProMed. Uh, in fact, I was able to confirm that there hadn't been any national response. They, they were handling it locally. Um, so, so, so sometimes very informal networks are, are very important. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Paul Kelly, thank you very much for your time and being available uh, in this podcast. Very much appreciated. Um, I wish you uh, the best for the working day. It's early in the morning uh, at your part of the world. So uh, thanks again. Thanks very much, Arnold. It's been a pleasure and happy to do this again at some other time if, if it's relevant. So, at the end of this podcast, let's summarize and put everything we know about how Coxella burnetti reaches us and how we can prevent from getting sick. For this, let's pretend that the left side of the screen is the outside world where Coxella live. And the right side of the screen is our internal world, the environment of our bodies and immune system. The causative agent is Coxiella burnetti, a rickettsia-like organism that can only grow within living cells of animals. A large group of animals is known to be able to host Coxiella burnetti and so forms a living reservoir for this agent. These animals, and in particular several products they, that may contain bodily fluids, such as straw, milk or even plain dust, can serve as sources of infection. Coxella is highly infectious and a single organism is sufficient to cause infection. The main transmission routes from reservoir and specific sources to the humans are airborne, in particular aerosolized contaminated dust, potentially waterborne, vectorborne, and this could be uh, within the reservoir between animals to keep the infection cycle going, but also towards humans. Then there could be foodborne transmission, for example, through uh, infected milk. Fomites, such as contaminated straw, contaminated building materials, etc. And finally, close contacts with infectious animals. Now, once in contact with the Q-fever agent, our immune system can deal with it, if it has built up an immune memory. And that can be through vaccination or through prior infection. But in non-immune individuals, contact can lead to infection. And from there, 
there are several options. We know that 50% of those with the infection will remain asymptomatic. They will not notice that they are infected and in fact stay healthy. The rest of the infected people develop disease symptoms, which are usually flu-like, but many cases develop an atypical pneumonia and occasionally hepatitis, a skin rash, and rarely a pericarditis or myocarditis. In 3 to 5% of these infections, people develop a chronic Q fever. And especially at risk are people with a prior heart disease and immunocompromised patient. And in 1 to 2% of the cases, the disease can prove fatal. Q fever is usually not transmitted from person to person. However, as long as people are infectious, they are potentially a risk to infect others. Under specific circumstances, infected people could infect others through blood transfusion or bone marrow transplantations. We have talked about prevention and control of this disease. Let's summarize the primary prevention measures. First of all, we can vaccinate reservoir animals. This is feasible in agricultural situations such as animal farms. These vaccines provide protection of the herds and therewith also reduce the risk of transmission to humans. Disadvantages are the costs. There is a vaccine available for human protection and this vaccine is produced and licensed in Australia, yet in most countries this is neither licensed nor available. The public health effects are positive, as we have heard in the interview from Dr. Kelly. Tick prevention when keeping animals reduces the risk that disease spreads among the animals. It, it will, of course, also reduce the risk of transmission to humans. Pasteurization of milk is one of the high impact and cost saving public health interventions of all times. Also in case of Q fever, it reduces the risk of milk borne transmission. Please, do not volunteer to drink unpasteurized milk on a farm if you value your health. Good animal husbandry not only includes tick prevention in the animals, but also safely disposing of birth products. Placentas of infected animals contain a billion infectious organisms per gram. Also, separate new or sick animals from the herd to reduce the risk of spreading the infection. Use proper disinfection of infected materials and contaminated stables with a 10% bleach solution. Then we have secondary and tertiary prevention, which can reduce the risk of serious outcome after infection has taken place. In case of Q fever, these include antibiotic treatment of acute Q fever infections. Even though most patients will recover naturally, the fact that part of them may develop serious complications or chronic Q fever is sufficient reason to treat every infection. In case of chronic Q fever, this antibiotic treatment sometimes has to be maintained for years in order to prevent further complications. A tertiary preventive measure is replacement of damaged cardiac valves after endocarditis in order to prevent further cardiovascular complications. Finally, if our preventive measures have failed and an outbreak of Q fever happens, such as was the case in the Netherlands, then an ultimate crisis control measure is culling of reservoir animals. In the Dutch example, we have seen how dramatic this can be. And obviously this is a good reason to make sure that our preventive measures are securely in place, our alert system monitors possible outbreaks and our outbreak response is adequate and effective. If you want to read more on Q fever, here are some references that were used in this podcast. My professional Bible is still Heyman's Control of Communicable Diseases Manual. The fascinating stories of the original search for the Nine Mile Agent by Davis and Cox, the mysterious abattoir fever investigation by Derek in Brisbane, the Welsh investigation of Q fever linked to renovation of an office building, and finally, the impressive PhD work by Moroy on chronic Q fever. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. We'll come back soon with transmissible briefs on new public health alerts.